to the Mythgard Academy for our 16th session on Morgoth's Ring as we are uh, long since past the point where we are making things up as we go along as far as the schedule is concerned. However, I have an ambition tonight. Now, my title for tonight's class uh, is The End of Finway and Muriel, uh, which, uh, which is, I thought, a fairly cunning title for tonight's class because it kind of hedges my bets. Uh, on the one hand, I am, my ambition is to complete the discussion of the, of the deaths and divorces and reconciliations of Finway and Muriel. Um, I want to get to the end of that whole section. That's my goal, my ambition, my highest ambition for the evening. Uh, but you see, if we don't get there, we will at least discuss the passages which describes which describe the end that Muriel and Finway come to, right? So it'll apply either way, one way or the other. Uh, so, <laughs> so I was, I was, I have to admit, I was kind of proud of that title for that reason. Uh, anyway, I always, I'm always so embarrassed when I title a class something and then we don't even get to the thing <laughs> that, the, that the class is, which of course, as you know, has happened several times, uh, during our Morgoth's Ring discussion. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Anyway, okay. So, uh, but before we get started, just one announcement tonight. One reminder, Myth Moot is coming up. We are now just over a week away uh, from Myth Moot. Myth Moot starts one week from tomorrow, uh, the 6th of August, from August 6th through August 9th. That is Thursday evening through Sunday afternoon at the end of the second half of next week. Um, this is going to be a delightful experience. We are, of course, doing this completely online, as you probably know, uh, and uh, it's going to be really fun. So just to, to, to emphasize again and to make sure everyone is clear on what the difference is between the two registration levels that we have, we have Mootcast and we have Moot Hub. Mootcast is the one to choose if you are not necessarily able to engage in real time with MythMoot. Um, if you're going to be kind of coming and going uh, th uh, throughout the weekend, you might want to pop in on some of the sessions, listen to some of the, uh, you know, the keynotes and some of the presentation, you know, the, 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 the creative or academic presentations and stuff like that. Um, and of course, if you want to have access to our uh, whole archives of the recordings of all of these things, um, then Mootcast uh, is the way to go. Uh, if, however, you are able to join us, there's a lot of extra stuff that's going to be going on in real time because I we, we are trying to preserve uh, with MythMoot this year, although we're going to be completely online, we're going to try to preserve as much as possible uh, the wonderful, uh, congenial community experience of being there uh, at MythMoot, getting to uh, getting to hang out, get to know each other better, um, getting chances to not only hear wonderful talks, but to have more informal conversations with everybody from our keynote instructors, you know, down to fellow attendees in the hall. Um, we're going to have a lot of opportunities uh, about that kind of thing. And yeah, we're going to be opening up uh, those uh, social channels for people who are signed up for Moot Hub early. Uh, we're going to open those up uh, it, this coming weekend, actually, uh, several days in advance of the conference so people can kind of uh, begin uh, to get into things and get warmed up uh, for the conference to start. Uh, so, uh, but now most of these, and there will be other events, of course, that will be, uh, uh, that, uh, folks who are in Moot Hub will have the opportunity to participate in, in addition to all of this sort of, uh, additional, um, uh, uh, you know, informal socialization and stuff. There, there will also be, um, uh, sort of special, again, often more informal sessions like our costume party and our uh, uh, the extra Q and A sessions with the uh, with the the keynote speakers and um, stuff like that. Um, so there's going to be a lot of really fun opportunities, um, and uh, those won't be recorded. So there won't be you know they won't be included in the archive. So again, those are really. 
there will be one experience, much fuller experience for those who are able to participate in real time because it's an event. That's what this is. You know, that it, not everything can be something that you can, you know, consume at your leisure later on. Sometimes you just got to be there, right, in order to experience it. Um, and so the, our two registration levels are basically our attempt as much as we can to do both, both to provide um, real time and asynchronous access to all of our panels and discussions through Mootcast. Um, that's where you do get the opportunity to sort of consume a lot of the material that we generate, a lot of the discussions that we have. You can do that at your own pace and for as long as you like. Um, but there's also the, uh, the sort of fleeting but really, really valuable um, synchronous experience of being a part of the event, uh, you know, being there uh, and connecting with folks. And that's what Moot Hub uh, is about. So um, there's only a $55 difference between the two for the four day event. So, uh, so it's a it's a uh, you know, this is certainly compared to the on site myth moot, which involves m way more costs. Uh, this is uh, this is certainly going to be a different kind of experience uh, and much more affordable. Anyway, so that's where things are. So I definitely want to, um, uh, uh, I definitely wanted to make sure to invite everybody, uh, to that, go to signumuniversity.org slash mythmoot. And you'll see all of that. We also have our preliminary schedule there. Um, a detailed, detailed schedules are going out to registrants very soon. Uh, so, uh, this should be, uh, this should be great. I'm, I'm excited about mythmoot. Um, I'm uh, sad that I don't get to travel. I I'm sad I'm not going to get to to see people and and uh, and hang out. I always look forward to Mythmoot so much. Uh, but despite the fact that we're not able to get together in person this year, I am uh, really excited to uh, uh, to to try things out. So, um, James uh, asks a very sensible question: Is there a registration deadline? Uh, well. Yeah, the end of the event. Uh, I mean, I don't think we're going to take Moot. I mean, I'm not sure when we're going to cut off Moot Hub registrations. We were cutting off, we were allowing Moot cast registrations all the way through the end. Like on, like through, on Sunday, people were still registering because you can still access all of the... Uh, uh, all of the recordings and everything. So even if you, but but you've got to sign up before the event. It's not something that we're gonna ha that we're gonna like be selling indefinitely. Um, these are still restricted to. This is still an event, right? Uh, and so you have if the if the event passes you by completely, you missed it. So um, for Moodcast, you can sign up through the end of the of the of the last time. Uh, you know, like through through Sunday. Mood Hub, I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, I, haven't even, I haven't really thought about that. But at the very least, up until the beginning, um, I would say probably until like Friday or something. I'd feel bad because, again, there's a lot of the Mood Hub stuff that's synchronous stuff. And so if you miss like a day and a half, you've missed a day and a half. Right. So I don't know. But um, uh, but anyway, at the very least, you can sign up for Mood Hub until the beginning of the conference and you can sign up for Mootcast until the end of the conference. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, when will we find out specific presentation schedules? Steven asks, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's funny. A lot of people, a lots of people like to ask me very specific, uh, myth moot questions, um, operating under the, uh, charming assumption that I'm in charge of it. And I'm totally not in charge of Mythmoot. I'm kept abreast of what's happening in Mythmoot planning, uh, and I have some input in like the big picture decisions. I mean, of course, I helped with the uh, the decision to uh, to you know be to go remote this year instead of trying to do an in person one. But I mean, apart from that kind of thing, I I don't do much of the planning. Uh, uh, so. I'm kind of waiting with everybody else. Um, but uh, the plan, I'm being informed, uh, is by this weekend, uh, there will be specific, the specific presentation schedules will be sent out and presenters themselves may know sooner um, uh, than that. So that's... Uh, that's the plan. Apparently, I am. I am. I am informed by a person who actually does know. Um, okay, awesome. So obviously, Mythmoot. We will have class next week. Uh, class next week will be like the night before Mythmoot. 
I guess that's one advantage. Often that means like the night before I'm leaving the house at like 5 a.m. to drive down to Virginia. So that'll be a little bit easier this year, I suppose. Um, but uh, anyway, we will uh, uh, we should be our, our our discussions here for a Mythgard Academy will be uninterrupted by Myth Myth this year. All right. Let us charge forward then and uh, see how far we can get with Finway and Muriel. So we fin we did complete the debate uh, of the Valar last time. Uh, and and thus we're going to resume the narrative. And here is where the narrative gets really wild. Wild, I say, especially uh, because this is stuff that is not in the published Silmarillion at all, right? There's a num there are a number of things that we're going to be talking about tonight, um, which were written later than the texts that Christopher included, chose to include in the published Silmarillion, but which he did not choose to include in the published Silmarillion. I have to admit, my own personal greatest disappointment from this whole very long section of Morgoth's Ring on, <laughs> probably not as long as we've made it feel, uh, but anyway, this whole long section on, on the, the issue of the marriage of, uh, of Finway and Muriel. Um, my biggest disappointment for Christopher Tolkien's presentation of all this is that he never explains the rationale for his choices in the published Silmarillion. Now, I know that's not like the primary purpose here, but uh, I, maybe I got kind of spoiled when he started doing that earlier on. Um, and I was kind of hoping for a little, you know, a few paragraphs explaining his rationale as he went through, because um, I would have been really, really excited to hear that. We'll do a little bit of speculation a little bit later. There's some other passages that I think give us some some grounds for speculation anyway, both about what Tolkien's own plans were and what maybe, possibly, what Christopher was thinking uh, when he did the, uh, the edition of the Silmarillion, the editing. Um, but whatever the reason may be, this stuff didn't make it in. So this comes with the death of Finway, because, of course, the big one of the very sensible questions, and this was, of course, a question that many of you were anticipating uh, during uh, our earlier discussions about the whole posthumous divorce thing. What happens when Finway dies? Um, and uh, you'll remember that one of the peculiarities of the uh, one of the many peculiarities of the Finway and Muriel situation is that Muriel's body doesn't die, right? Her spirit leaves her body. Her body is healed after the birth of Feanor. Her body is healed and her body recovers, but her spirit leaves it, right? And remember, that was a factor. Uh, she was judged uh, by Olmo, right, to be at fault. Uh, f with a deficit of hope, not guilty, but at fault for a deficit of hope because uh, she she could have returned to her body and she de she decided she was out. She wanted nothing more to do with life and chose to remain uh, instead of coming back to be reborn. Right. So uh her, but the result of the sort of semi abdication of her body by Muriel is that her body's fine, right? Her body is is kind of alive and preserved. Uh, they're not mummified, right? But actually, like, I don't even know. Like, does it need nourishment? Does she have an IV in place? I don't. I don't I'm not gonna. I'm not. I don't understand. Um, we're not giving any given, of course, any of those kinds of details. Um, but Muriel's body is still in play, essentially, right? Which makes Muriel's situation, well, as far as we know, unique uh, among elves, right? It was already in an important position. Uh, first, because of the newness, right? She was the first elf to die in uh, Valinor. But secondarily, it, and of course, and it was you know unique because of the whole remarriage situation. But even apart from that, so far as so not only was it the first, as far as I know, it's the only one of this kind. There are other elves who die of grief and 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 you know make a similar kind of decision to sort of abdicate their bodies. But when they do. They leave corpses behind and the corpses decay, right? Muriel, because she left her body in Lorien, 
in Valinor, right, where like the place of healing, where so like they took care of her body, but they couldn't do anything about her spirit, right? And so it left. So anyway, so remember that the situation uh, that is being described in these narrative passages is premised on the fact that Muriel's body is still in action. Well, not in action, but still in play uh, there in Valinor. Okay, so Finway appeals. When he dies, Finway appeals to say, hey, let Muriel go. Changed my mind, says Finway. Now I'm dead, right? And I'm here. So let Muriel go on a technicality. Right. Because, yes, it's true. We agreed to a posthumous divorce because it's a, because according to the statute, no elf can have more than one spouse living. Right. Like it's just it's not possible. Uh, like polygamy is is like a theoretical, practically a theoretical impossibility. It is like completely anti uh, the statute, clearly. Right. But Finway says, hey. There, nothing in the statute says that I can't be in Mandos and both of my wives alive at the same time. Because <laughs> then technically we're still following the letter of the law. No one, no two, no three people are married all at once, right? Because I'm on the other side of the divide and so they're both cut off from me. So, you know, if Muriel and I, so since I'm here, let, let me swap with Muriel, right? So that's Finway's, um, that's Finway's proposal. But Mandos was unmoved, and the body of Muriel lay at rest in Lorien until the escape of Melkor the Marrer and the darkening of Valinor. In that evil time, Finway was slain by the Marrer himself, and his body was... Oh, sorry, this is before the appeal. I apologize. And his body was burned as by lightning stroke and was destroyed. Then Muriel and Finway met again in Mandos, and lo, Muriel was glad of the meeting, and her sadness was lightened, and the will in which she had been set was released." So she finds a kind of healing here. And when she learned of Finway all that had befallen since her departure, for she had given no heed to it, nor asked tidings until then, she was greatly moved, and she said to Finway in her thought, I erred in leaving thee and our son, or at least in not soon returning after brief repose, for I, had I done so, he might have grown wiser. But the children of Indus shall redress his errors, and therefore I am glad that they should have being, and Indus hath my love. How should I bear grudge against one who received what I rejected and cherished what I abandoned? What would that I might set all the tale of our people and of thee and thy children in a tapestry of many colors as a memorial brighter than memory? For though I am cut off now from the world and I accept that doom as just, I would still watch and record all that befalls those dear to me and their offspring also added, I feel again the call of my body and its skills. Okay, so notice once again, you know, if, we, if you remember way back, of course it's not way back in the text, but it's way back in our discussions, uh, to the very, very first draft of the whole Finway Muriel situation, the one that was making me giggle all the time. Um, one of the things, remember one of the kind of, sort of horrible passages there was remember how Muriel in the in that very first version was doomed to weave tapestries which depicted like what happened with all the Noldor right which kind of seemed like a horrible sort of purgatorial punishment at the time um but uh uh anyway um i think this is a this is a marvelous revision right we've already looked at how how finway comes across much better Right. How not only how Finway's position is more sort of movingly stated, but um, we can see how, again, in the very first draft, it sort of sounded like he was just trying to jettison Muriel and move on. Uh, and uh, uh, and we could see in the revision, uh, you know, his understanding and his compassion. Um, uh, and now with Muriel as well. Right. This whole situation, the way that that initial concept right of Muriel weaving a tapestry uh, of the deeds of the Noldor, right? Now is evidence of healing, right? It's now evidence of healing. We can see how she is being her own, her own sadness is being lightened and the will in which she had been set was released, right? Her will was released. Like it had been locked up, 
before. And remember Vire's characterization of Muriel, right? One of those, she's one of those people who once she has said a thing shall be, will not allow herself to change her mind, right? Muriel's mind is changed. That's a growth moment for Muriel. This is healing that's happening here. That's, it's, I think this is a beautiful thing. And that he takes that thing, which was, I got to tell you, one of the most like kind of uh, darkly comical elements, I felt, of the first draft has now been transformed into, I, I find, something really beautiful uh, and something really moving. And, um, and it points to this larger healing. Remember, her lack of desire to return to her body was a fault. I, I think we have every reason to believe that that Olmo kind of speaks for Tolkien here, right? Um, Manway agreed that Olmo was correct. Um, it was a failure of hope, right? Again, not a, not a crime, not a sin, but it was a fault. Um, and that fault has now been redressed. And that's, I think, a beautiful thing. And her own desire, the reawakening of her desire to create. She's not, not only has she not shown any curiosity about what was going on with her friends and family uh, while she's been here, um, but she didn't have um, the impulse to, um, she didn't have the impulse to weave, right? I mean, her, her, her artistic impulse was, I don't want to say stifled. That suggests an outside, um, an outside influence, right? Something else stifling her, but like repressed or um, abandoned even, right? Um, she seemed to be sort of um, empty, right? Uh, in some, in some sense. Um, and certainly I would say her healing incomplete. And I think that also, remember the, the way that the words natural and unnatural were being used? Like what was natural, you know, natural meaning like how it would have been in, in the, in Arda unmarred and that kind of thing. Remember that, that, that first thing, uh, that hope looks to what should be, right? And clearly for the elves, what should be is that inclination towards the artistic impulse, right? If she wasn't feeling it, if she had no desire to either know what happened or to weave about it, she was, that was clearly, there was something missing, right? That's not, that's a, a marred situation, Right. Um, and so, again, this suggests to me, certainly uh, a step of healing. And it's fascinating that that's then coupled with her desire for her body. Right. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel again the call of my body and its skills. Right. Um, because that, too, um, is part of the nature of elves, right? For the for the Fea and the Hroa to be combined together. Her when her Fea turned its back on her Hroa, that was there was brokenness there. Um and that brokenness has now been made whole again. Uh great. Except now it's against the law. So now what? Right. Um yeah. <laughs> Carita says, I think this story is interesting and kind of painful when looked at from the perspective of anyone with a dead or absent parent. Seems like even immortal elves have potential for these sorts of complicated relationships with parents. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's... Um, Carita, I sometimes think one of the responses that occasionally people make uh, when we're talking about, like, elves dying and stuff... Um, Sometimes people will talk like, yeah, well, but for elves, it's not a big deal, right? Um, you know, death is like the death of the body is just a mere inconvenience. Like, just hang on and you'll, you'll, you know, it's fine. You'll, you'll get back together soon. Um, yeah, kind of, maybe. But, but Karita, I think you're right. Like, this is always complicated, right? I mean, it's, uh, it, it creates complicated. And of course, it doesn't even have to be to like Finway and Muriel levels of complication, right, for it still to be a fairly complicated situation. Uh, now, Francis, I agree with you that this is a really one of the really interesting things about this moment is the fact that they that they meet. Right. 
The one thing, Francis, we were told before is that there can be no communication between the living and the dead, right? So if you're in Mandos, you can never, you cannot communicate with the living. Um, that's, that's not, that's not allowed. That's why Finway and Muriel had to use Manway as a go-between, right? Because uh, the Valar can get messages to and from spirits that are in Mandos, but the elves cannot. Well, again, only through, uh, only through the Valar. So that's why they have to appeal directly uh, to, um, uh, to, to Manway, uh, instead of, or I guess indirectly, uh, through Manway. Um, well, no, you're appealing to Manway, but, and he's got to do the communication in both directions there. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't rem I don't recall Francis. Does anybody else remember if this represents a change? Did he say earlier on that spirits and Mandos didn't ever meet or talk. I mean, I remembered that it was quite possible that they wouldn't and that sometimes they would be, you know, like during the process of healing and, and stuff. I know it's not like automatic, like, you know, the halls of waiting in Mandos are just like one large, one big lounge, you know, and you just get ushered into the lounge as soon as you, your body dies. And so, you know, like everybody, you know, greets you when you walk through the door, like I remember them talking about how it's, it's, you know, the sort of stages of the healing process in the halls of waiting are often, um, don't always work like that. Yes. Steven, I kind of was thinking exactly of, uh, of Norm walking into cheers actually was precisely the image I had in my head there. Um, but, um, but I don't think it was impossible. Mary, that was my m memory too, that they, that they, don't often communicate with each other. It's not the norm uh, for them to communicate with each other. Uh, but it is. Um, uh, but it, but I, I don't think he ever said it was impossible to do. Um, yeah, yeah. And Karita, I I do agree. I you know Karita says a lot of kids feel a sense of abandonment when a parent dies prematurely. It's very sad thinking of being an elf kid, uh, knowing his mom could come back, but chose not to. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, one of the things, one of the things that is to me, one of the most fascinating sort of subplots, and we haven't even, I mean, we talked about this some, but we haven't talked about this nearly as much as we talked about other things. Um, but it's also one of the things which is sort of the, the, one of the subtexts, I think, of this whole Finway and Muriel situation is Feanor. Right. And what it means for Feanor and how like, the ways in which Tolkien is retroactively contextualizing Feanor. Feanor did Feanor things. Right. I mean, Feanor, the Silmarils, the Kinslaying, the burning of the ships. Those are old stories. Feanor has been misbehaving in these ways for a long time. The oath. Right. I mean, um, so Feanor's misbehavior is 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 old in Tolkien's mythology. Um, all of this context is new and fascinating fast. So, I mean, although in some ways it, it has felt perhaps at times like this whole Finway and Muriel section has been a little bit, um, obsessive compulsive, right? Like a, a really strange dilation on a, on a really random little moment, uh, in the mythology there's, you know, really important things. We've been focusing especially on the sort of theological and philosophical ramifications of it. And that's clearly one of the main things that Tolkien has been thinking about as well. I mean, Finway and Muriel's situation is what was the springboard for Tolkien to systematically re-examine what death meant to the elves. That's clearly a big deal. Um, but there's this sort of secondary really big deal as well, right? Which is the creation of a phenomenal new, phenomenal new layers of psychological depth uh, to Feanor's character and situation, which I think is really, um, is really amazing. Um, yeah, good. Josiah, thank you. Josiah found a, a quote for me uh, about the Halls of Waiting. 
Um, okay, he had said, There is in the halls of waiting little mingling or communing of kind with kind, or indeed of any one fea with another, for the houseless fea is solitary by nature and turns only towards those with whom, maybe, it formed strong bonds of love in life. Great. Thank you, Josiah, for finding that passage. It's very helpful. So we can see it fits in perfectly well. That that, that Muriel and Finway would meet again fits in perfectly well with what was said before. But it is unusual. It's We're not supposed to imagine this as being a sort of a the, an average day in the halls of waiting, really. Um, yeah. OK, let's see. Um, Carita, we... The only, well, we'll get to some of this in a little bit, but the only thoughts or feelings of Feanor about the situation that we get are mostly his displeasure at his father's second marriage um, uh, and the fairly obvious rivalry that he feels with his half-brothers, um, especially Fingolfin. Uh, but I don't remember any comment directly upon Muriel. Like, you know, Carita, I, what I assume you're referring back to, uh, to your previous comment, like his sense of abandonment that his mom left and just refused to come back. Um, that, I don't recall any comment about that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mary, I do assume that they can communicate because their spouse is the bond but that was between them. Um, certainly would enable this. Um, yeah, yeah, Carita, exactly. Feanor does have a complicated relationship with death from the very start, um, which does make him a little bit easier to understand. I think it doesn't excuse, you know, nothing that happens here excuses what Feanor does, right? But it does help us to explain. And the fact that that's all done through retcon, essentially, um, is kind of amazing to me. Um, and that it fits that well that Tolkien can create the psychological circumstances. Doesn't it feel like, I mean, hasn't it felt like as we've been going through this whole section, haven't you been feeling like, um, oh, now I understand Feanor so much better, right? Like, as if we were just having revealed to us the truth of what lay behind the story of Feanor we've always known. But of course, historically speaking, that's not what's been happening. What's been happening is Tolkien has been forming that context around the pre-existing story. Um, and it's, um, he is so good at that. Anyway, okay. Let's keep going. And Finway said to Vire, Dost thou hear the prayer and desire of Muriel? Why will Mandos refuse this redress of her griefs, that her being may not be void and without avail? Behold, I instead will abide with Mandos forever, and so make amends. For surely if I remain unhoused and forego life in Arda, then his doom will be inviolate. It's not breaking the rules if I do it. Notice, notice how, what's happened here, right? The choice to remain indefinitely in the halls of waiting and not to get a body back was a failure in hope before, in Muriel. But remember what Finway failed at? He also failed. He failed in perfect love, right? He could have remained patient, um, even though suffering. Um, and in doing so, he would have shown more perfect love for Muriel, which might perhaps have helped and enabled her to change her mind in return later on. Remember, that's when Vire breaks in and is like, nah, I don't think so. Right. Um, and but you'll remember also that I said at the time that Vire's views on Muriel were an opinion and not a fact. As we see, Muriel is changing her mind here. Um, but again, notice how Tolkien has taken those two things, the two faults committed by Muriel and Finway respectively, the choice to not return to her body by Muriel and the choice to not wait indefinitely for Muriel on Finway's part. She was guilty of a lack of hope. He's guilty. He was guilty of, uh, or he, her fault was lack of, uh, was lack of hope. His fault, uh, was imperfection of love, right? Also lack of hope. Um, and it would, on the, on superficially, it seems like he's recapitulating her fault. Right now, he's going to never return to his body. Is this two wrongs making a right? 
Uh, no, actually. Notice how it's what he's doing kind of takes their two faults, combines them, and transforms them. Now, his offer to not return to his body is not a sign of despair, but of love. It's an act of self-sacrifice on his part. He is going to sacrifice uh, explicitly to make amends. Because he failed in perfect love before, now he is going to show love for her by sacrificing any fut possibility of future return to his body so that she might do so. And they will still, all three of them, him and Muriel and Indies, uh, uh, abiding by the doom of Mandos. Um, and then Vire comes with the cold water. <laughs> so thou may deem, answered Vire. Yet Mandos is stern, and he will not readily permit a vow to be revoked. Also, he will consider not only Mirio and thee, but Indis and thy children, whom thou seemest to forget, pitying now Muriel only. Oops. Yeah, well, there is that, Finway. Um, now Finway has, a, like, if he shows this love for Muriel, which is quite beautiful, then he's failing in perfect love for his second wife, too. Oh, dear. Um, it's almost like this whole thing was maybe not... Uh, not a <laughs> perfect idea in the first place. Um, it's almost like grief and sorrow are going to come of choices that are made seeking justice instead of hope, right? And here it is. Thou art unjust to me in thy thought, said Finway. It is unlawful to have two wives, but one may love two women, each differently, and without diminishing one love by another. Love of Indus did not drive out love of Mirio, so now pity for Mirio doth not lessen my heart's care for Indus. But Indus parted from me without death. I had not seen her for many years, and when the Marer smote me, I was alone. She hath dear children to comfort her, and her love, I deem, is now most for Ingoldo. That's Fingolfin, of course. His father she may miss, but not the father of Feanaro. But above all her heart, but above all, her heart now yearns for the halls of Ingwe and the peace of the Vanyar, far from the strife of the Noldor. Little comfort should I bring her if I returned, and the lordship of the Noldor hath passed to my sons. So in order to make a three-way happily ever after here, Indus is now done with him, right? So basically, Finway is now like wanting sort of a posthumous divorce with Indus, saying they basically kind of parted consensually and uh, she will miss him if he doesn't come back. And that's OK. So he's not doing any harm to her. Um, Got to tell you, I'm not. 100% moved by his argument here, and I would quite like to hear from Indus uh, on this point, I have to admit. Um, uh, but I do like his opening statement. Um, uh, Brian, yeah, I agree. It sounds a little bit like self-justification. It does. It does. Um, and... Uh, yeah, and you're right, it's not a posthumous divorce, only a posthumous separation, Stephen. Though, of course, his argument is that the separation actually happened before he became posthumous, right? Um, uh, and David Attlee, yes, it's true that this type of parting among, among elvish spouses is considered normal. Um, that is, that their interests sort of after they have children uh, and their interests kind of diverge and they may spend long years apart. That is a normal part of elvish marriage that often happens in elvish marriage. But of course, the again, the sort of obvious rebuttal to Finway's comments here about Indus is that um, this is known about elvish marriage, that they do go in separate directions. They don't, you know, they're, uh, uh, their hearts don't always go on growing in the same way as Treebeard might say. Um, and they separate geographically, right? And live apart uh, for some time, possibly an extended period of time. Um, 
but that doesn't change the fact that elvish marriage is indissoluble and they are still bound together right um so yeah i'm not uh, not real convinced uh by that um but um Yeah. Yeah. I, I, as I say, I think his speech starts off better than it ends. Um, little comfort should I bring her if I returned? Well, says you, Finway. But still, I don't want to get away from the fact that I do think his pity for Muriel is uh, uh, is a good thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> Stephen suggests... Maybe swearing an oath based on current feelings rather than rational <laughs> thought and conclusions might help, right? Uh, I, yeah, you, what you're saying, like the rest of his family does, uh, Stephen. Um, I think Finway's the only one in the family who hasn't uh, engaged in any such oath swearing, so uh, maybe he's feeling left out. Um, anyway, let's keep going. But when Mandos was approached, he said to Finway, It is well that thou desirest not to return. For this I should have forbidden until the present griefs are long past. <laughs> Mandos is like, so um irrelevant. You can't you can't go you can't go back anyway, even if you wanted to. But it is better still that thou hast made this offer to deprive thyself of thy free will and out of pity for another. This is a counsel of healing out of which good may grow. So Mandos agrees, um, you know, with what I was saying before, that this is uh that, that this is a good thing, right? Far from being a fault which shows a lack of hope, like Finway's original imperfection of love and Muriel's original failure of hope, um, his self-sacrificial offer is a counsel of healing. This is a good sign and good may grow out of it. Therefore, when Nienna came to him and renewed her prayer for Muriel, he consented. And accepting the abnegation of Finway, accepting the abnegation of Finway as her ransom. So at Nienna's request, Mandos agrees and accepts Finway's. This is where it starts getting wild, right? This is where we start leaving the published Silmarillion behind, right? So Finway agrees to stay and Muriel is released. Then the Fea of Muriel was released and came before Manway and received his blessing. And she went then to Lorien and re-entered her body and awoke again as one that cometh out of a deep sleep. And she arose and her body was refreshed. But after she had stood in the twilight of Lorien a long while in thought, remembering her former life and all the tidings that she had learned, her heart was still sad and she had no desire to return to her own people. Therefore she went to the doors of the house of Vire and prayed to be admitted, and this prayer was granted, although in that house none of the living dwelt, nor have others entered it in the body, nor have, and, uh, nor have others ever entered it in the body. But Muriel was accepted by Vire and became her chief handmaid, and all tidings of the Noldor down the years from their beginning were brought to her, and she wove them in webs historial, so fair and skilled that they seemed to live, imperishable, shining with light of many hues, fairer than are known in Middle-earth. This labor Finway is at times permitted to look upon, and still she is at work, though her name has been changed. For now she is named Firia, which to the Eldar signifies she that died, and also she that sighed. As fair as the webs of Firiel is praise that is given seldom, even to works of the Eldar. Okay. Uh, David Urbach asks, is there a difference between historial and historical? Yes. Historial just means telling stories, basically. Um, uh, uh, history in that sense, the sense of like an ongoing story. Uh, historical would mean like in the past um she wove them in webs historial suggesting ongoing she is doing the ongoing so like somewhere uh during the fellowship of the ring muriel was off in the house of vire weaving uh the story of the meeting of frodo and gildor and glorian for instance 
right because he's in her house uh and so uh that was uh, that was still that was still ongoing um uh yeah yeah um yeah so cecilia i agree that on the one hand it seems a little strange that Finway should abnegate his body and should sacrifice himself. And then she just comes back, but she comes back in the body. So she goes back to her body, but then doesn't do anything and just comes back sort of to the halls of waiting. Right. Um, but I think that if we allow ourselves to think, well, that was a waste. Right. I think we're missing some important things here. Notice where's the emphasis in that last paragraph, the emphasis in that last paragraph is on her weavings, right? Remember that her call to her skill, um, the subcreative desire that wells up in Muriel again um, when she responds in love to the pity of Finway, um, that's, that's, that's healing. That's a restoration of what should be, right? Um, that's her returning to her natural state uh, and away from her, the kind of stasis, the sort of unhealed stasis in which she had locked herself by her own refusal to return to her body. Right. Um, and we see the fruit born of that. She So does Finway's sacrifice bear fruit? Absolutely it does. In all of the, uh, in all of the webs of Furio uh, for all of the rest of time. And that, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Um, and it shows like a thing has been set right now, right? A thing that might have been, that should have been now is and will be because of Finway's abnegation. It's not perfect, right? We still don't really know all the ins and outs of how Indus's story is affected. We don't get Indus's perspective on this latter bit. Um, but, uh, uh, nor, you know, Finway's choice never to return. There's presumably consequences of that things that he might've done that would be unfulfilled. But, um, but again, man, remember Mandos's sort of commendation, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, we will come back to the question of the house of Vire. Christopher Tolkien gets a little bothered about this later on. Um, Spoiler, I'm a lot less bothered about it than Christopher is there, but we'll come back to that later on when we get to Christopher's passage on it. Um, but um, the name change. So Stephen says, is there a connection between died and side or are they just coincidental homophones? I think it may, it's a coincidence that they're homophones in English uh, uh, like that or that they rhyme in English. Um, but... Um, no, I don't think it's coincidental. Uh, it has to do with with breathing, right? Uh, those of you who know the etymologies more than I do uh, or can look it up uh, might be able to tell me. But I'm I th if I'm thinking correctly, um, those two things like it, it's it's about the expiration of breath, right? Um, which can be used in two senses, uh, one in the sense of like to breathe your last, right? And for life to leave your body and the other for the heaving of a sigh, right? In both cases, I think, I think the core, the concept that links the two of them, um, uh, in the rude words is, uh, uh, is, is that, yeah, yeah. Sighing deeply when her fea left. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, David, I know that there's that similarity of connection, uh, in, uh, uh, in, English and Latin. I meant in the, I meant in the, the, the Quenya words, but, um, anyway, uh, yep, exactly. Yeah. Muriel sighing deeply when her Faya left. Exactly. But the, so the, the, those two things are clearly linked. Um, but of course you can see how the two concepts are linked as well. Right. I mean, it was her sighing 
which was an outward sign of her sorrow, pain, weakness, um, and her death. Like those two things were, you know, the same, right? Um, the one was an expression of the other. Um, but of course, it's interesting in retrospect that her name means she that died or she that sighed, right? And of course, both of them are in the past tense, in the past tense, as she is neither dying nor sighing anymore. Uh, in the, she is, she's been healed. Um, okay. George says, based on the statue, statute, can Indus remarry now? <laughs> Oh my goodness, George, as if this weren't more complicated enough already. Yes, sure, absolutely. Yep, totally legal for Indus to marry again. Um, uh, totally legal for Indus to marry again uh, because Finway is like 100% committed to not coming back now because he's abnegated for Muriel's sake. Uh, so, yep, yep. She's a free agent again. Raise your hand if you think it's a good idea for Indus to, to marry again. <laughs> Let's just cut our losses, shall we? Um, uh, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, David, I, I agree. David Atley says, I don't see Indus remarrying. It doesn't seem consistent with her character. Yeah, I agree. I don't I don't think so either. Um uh, not to mention the fact, of course, there's a big difference between Finway's situation that led him to want to remarry and Indus's, right? I mean, to, look, she's, she has five kids, for instance. What does she want? More kids? I mean, she's like, five is not enough. I need more children. Like, I don't think so. Like, it's, I, yeah. So, um, um, yeah. Well, now, Jocelyn, we don't know what anybody told Indus. Um, we, uh, we're, I mean, this is not Indus's story, right? So we're not told her response to this. We're not told... Um, but just because it's not her story and we're not being told doesn't mean that she that she was never informed or never given the option. Um, the statute has been, you know, published and everything. Everybody knows this. Uh, so I, I don't think we have any reason to think it's like a, you know, like a, a secret from Indus. But uh, but um, but yeah, we just but certainly we don't know directly now. Um, Furio is a really interesting name. Right. It is a name that you can find in a couple other places. Right. One. Yes, you're right, Michael, that it uh, is used uh, for a queen of Gondor. There's a queen of Gondor whose name is Furiel. Um, and the meaning of the name uh, there, Michael says, is given as mortal maiden. Yes. The dying one. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, does anybody else remember? Uh OK, no, that's sorry. This is that's a little too obscure a trivia question. OK, let me ask it because I already asked it so you can impress me if you know. But this is a super obscure trivia question. Anybody know where else uh, that's from Josiah? Yes, it is from a poem. Uh, but this is a tricky question. Um, if you <laughs> sorry, if you know the um, uh, the Adventures of Tom Bombadil poetry collection, right? Um the poem in that collection, which is published in the in the collection as the last ship about the mortal woman who goes out at dawn uh, to the riverside and sees the Elvis ship coming down the last ship going out to sea. Uh, and they call to her and invite her to come with them. And she's like, yes, but no. And then she goes back home uh, and the elves have departed um, uh, that poem. Uh, was originally titled Furiel. Um, Furiel is the mortal woman who is in that poem. So uh, that is a really, um, a really interesting connection. If you uh, so, having read the story of Muriel and thought about sort of Muriel in this way to kind of to go back to that poem uh, afterwards uh, and read is a really interesting study. Um, but anyway, okay, just a little side light there. Um, more on Furiel, though. Uh, for before the passing of Muriel, the Eldar of Valinor had no word for dying in this manner, though they had words for being destroyed in body or being slain. But Fire meant to expire, as of one sighing or releasing a deep breath. And at the passing of Muriel, she had sighed a great sigh and then lay still. And those who stood by said, Fire, 
she hath breathed forth. This word the Eldar afterwards used of the death of men. But though this sigh they take to be a symbol of release and the, casing, and the ceasing of the body's life, the Eldar do not confound the breath of the body with the spirit. This they all, as hath been seen, thea or fire. Sorry, this they call, as hath been seen, thea or fire, of which the ancient significance seems rather to be radiance. For though the thea in itself is not visible, to the to bodily eyes. It is in light that the Eldar find the most fitting symbol in bodily terms of the indwelling spirit, the light of the house, or koakalina, as they also name it. And those in whom the fea is strong and untainted, they say, appear even to mortal eyes to shine at times, translucent, albeit faintly, as though a lamp burned within. Several really interesting things here. First thing of note is that, again, thinking back, David, to your point about Furiel being translated mortal woman, right? Um, this verb, which was invented or essentially applied anew uh, to Muriel's uh, situation, uh, Muriel's death, right, um, uh, is the word that they use for the death of men, right? Um, and so Muriel's death and therefore the Furiel situation, really, um, the link back from Muriel renamed Furiel, the mortal Furiel that we get in the poem, The Last Ship, uh, with this sort of name and concept as the inter intermediary between them, tying them both to the concept of mortal death, uh, is really, really interesting. Um, especially in the way that I... So here's the, the one step that I can't help but go here, right? Um, which is to me really, really fascinating. Muriel, as Olmo says, failed of hope, right? Failed of perfect hope. Uh, in her desire to leave and not ever come back, to, to, to sunder permanently her fea and her hroa. In fact, there is a way in which this begins to look as if she is pining for the fate of men, for a mortal fate, right? She doesn't want, she's turning her back on the elvish life, which means for the Thea and the Hroa to be combined throughout life. She wants to, she seems to want to leave Arda. Remember when she says way back at the beginning, I mean, she's been saying this for a long time in terms of drafts, right? Um, maybe healing can be found beyond Arda, but not within, right? She wants to leave Arda. She doesn't see any hope for her within Arda. And that's like a pretty weird thing for an elf to say. What else is there, right? Um, they are, by their natures, bound to Arda. So it's interesting, right? Her her connection to mortality, not just the whole elvish death situation, the whole sundering of the separation and potential reunion, uh, in her case, a remarkable and unique kind of reunion uh, between the Thea and the Hroa. Uh, her, I think uh, Muriel is the only example of an elf who um, is reunited with her original body, right? Which makes you wonder, like, where is she on the consuming her Hroa scale? The others probably have a big old head start, don't they? But anyway, never mind. doesn't matter. Um, uh, but anyway, the, so the, 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 the specter of the gift of men seems to me to have been raised already by Muriel, right? And so the way that that concept is being kind of transformed in, Tol or in Tolkien's mind, or rather we see him working out that idea in different ways in the poem Furiel. Now, somebody remind me because I'm forgetting this. Um, if anybody who has the Hammond and Skull edition, the, recent, the more recent one, uh, the Hammond and Skull edition of The Adventures of Tom Bombadil. Could you look up the poem Furial for me in the appendix uh, to there and tell me wh what what is their estimate of when that was composed? When did he write the original Furial poem? I know that it was revised for the 
publication, which was in the early 60s, which was only a few years after he's writing this stuff. That's what I want to figure out. How, how long before? Because I don't remember. Furio originally was written in the early 30s. Okay, good. I thought it was an old one. A lot of them were. Um, I know there are a few of them that were written relatively late, but I didn't think that was one of them. Okay, in the 30s. Great. Thanks, Josiah. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So we so we know that this so this anyway, and there's now is not the time for me to indulge in a detailed comparison and contrast of the original Furial poem and the later Last Ship poem that he revises for the adventures of Tom Bombadil. But from my memory of the last time I did that comparison, um, I'm pretty sure, and especially if we I think if we were to come to that right now from this context, um, thinking about this stuff that he's thinking through in the late 50s, I think that we would begin to see a little bit more clearly um, how this kind of stuff is influencing that. Um, the original Furial poem was quite different uh, from the revised version. So that would be a, a really fun, uh, a really fun study to do. But me, I'm focused. We're moving like rapidly. So, um, yeah. Now, George points out this goes some way in explaining why the death of men is called a gift. And George, that's a really, really important point. Right. Um, we already see he's not yet there yet. Tolkien isn't right. I mean, that is all of this consideration of the nature of elves and Fea and Roa and what death means and what um, the 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 fate of elves would be in Arda unmarred and all that stuff. Like all these kinds of things we've been talking about, these big philosophical and theological issues have been totally elf centric so far. We haven't even talked really. Uh, Tolkien hasn't been dealing with mortality and human mortality. Um, Having thought through the Elvish situation like this, though, we're going to bring it into contact with the next step, right? So what does this tell us about mortal death? Um, what is how, how does this provide context for the gift uh, of Iluvatar to men? And that, of course, is what we're going to see uh, in the Athrabeth pretty soon. Um, but yes, George, we can already see that this one link itself begins to already give give us a hint right to help us to to recontextualize uh if ever you know if ever we were tempted to see the immortality of the elves and then you know the short span of humans like the humans that you know they get a gift they get the gift which nobody wants right um uh that uh, you know to see if we see uh, if we imagine the el you know the firstborn and the secondborn children of Iluvatar uh, you know, like uh, children opening their gifts under the Christmas tree. Uh, you know, it was pretty clear who uh, whose gift is less, a pre you know, who got the socks and underwear and, you know, who got the, the you know, the awesome toy. So uh, it's often easy to think about it that way, right? Like, you know, human beings just kind of get the shaft uh, and Iluvatar's gift is strange is the most uh, uh, generous characterization of the gift that Iluvatar gives. But George, again, you're right. We can already begin to see how he's thinking through that in some new and I think really fascinating ways. Um, uh, okay. But yes, the other thing about light. So notice how Tolkien, of course, perfectly well aware of the fact that this connection between breathing out and dying, like the, that the fact the English word expire means both, right? It means to breathe out and it also means to die. Um, and of course, there are many languages in which that connect, that connection happens, right? When in fact, the, the concept of the spirit or the soul is linguistically rooted in the word for wind, right? This is true in Greek. This is true. We can even see the same thing, uh, in Hebrew, uh, right. You see this in Genesis chapter two, uh, when God forms Adam out of the dust of the ground and then breathes the breath of life into his nostrils. Right. So that Adam's breath in, you know, that, that he and, and he becomes a living creature. Right. So the soul enters into Adam with the breath of God. And so, again, the soul being connected with breath. Um, so this fundamental idea, this fundamental metaphor 
uh, uh, not even metaphor. I mean, this, of course, goes back uh, through. We don't to get into this uh, in too much detail. Um, uh, but this uh, goes back through uh, Barfield's uh, uh, stuff um, about linguistic connections, right? About how these these things which we which in the modern world are now like puns or uh, uh, or sort of different senses didn't have different senses originally, right? That there was one sense and that, you know, wind and soul are one of the examples uh, that he uses uh, to, uh, uh, to, to talk about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Uh, so, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm completely blanking. Somebody remind me the title of Barfield's book. I'm like, losing my mind the the thing that i'm talking about there um why can't i come up with the title of barfield's most famous book holy cow i'm losing my i'm losing my mind what's it called ah god poetic diction thank you ah whew. oh my goodness yes thank you mary and aaron and Alyssa. i appreciate that poetic diction by Owen Barfield uh, is the book, if you would like to read more about that. Um, but anyway, fascinatingly, Tolkien wants to point out that although that same fundamental concept seems to be at play with the theory of with Fyrie, right? Um, that's not the metaphor. That's not how it works for the Eldar. They did not think of the Fea as wind, as spirit, as air, as pneuma, you know, to use the Greek word, um, they thought of the, um, they thought of the Thea as light. Um, they find light in light. They find the most fitting symbol in bodily terms of the indwelling spirit. Uh, so as soon as I read that last sentence, um, those in whom the Thea is strong and untainted, they say, appear even to mortal eyes to shine at times translucent, albeit faintly, as though a lamp burned within. Uh, as soon as I read that, um, uh, Mary said, like Glorfindel, which is exactly right. Uh, and Stephen, uh, at the same time, said, like Frodo, which is also right. That's what Sam is describing, right? Uh, remember Sam talks about how it shines through sometimes? Um, yes, yes, like Frodo. Exactly. Um, and I think that this is a really important context to Gandalf's reflection when he's looking at Frodo and says that he may become um, like a glass, right? Josiah, absolutely, and Goadriel's wells of light. Yes, in her eyes, absolutely, absolutely. Yep, yep. Um fascinating stuff. Okay. So then we've got beginning to border on the Athrobeth here. This is, uh, uh, so again, Tolkien says, the fate of men was also just later discussed by the Eldar when they had met men and knew them, but they had little evidence and therefore did not know or assert, but supposed or guessed. One such supposition was that elves and men will become one people. Another is that some men, if they desire it, will be permitted to join the elves in new Arda, or to visit them there, though it will not be the home of men. The most widely held supposition is that the fate of men is wholly different and that they will not be concerned with Arda at all. Um, and that so that they truly are just visitors. They come to Arda, they hang out for a while, and then they're gone. They go somewhere else, and wherever that is, that's their place, right? And so that they're never going to return. So when Arda is remade, remember that Remember the second half of True Hope? The first half of True Hope is holding to the Arda that should be, right? To the to the vision of Arda unmarred, even though Arda has been marred, right? Um, and the other half of True Hope is faith in Arda restored, in Arda healed, right? In the new Arda. But a lot of the elves are thinking, yeah, humans aren't going to be around for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, we're not going to talk about this much. Um, uh, as Christopher adds, at the end of this note, my father wrote subsequently, but see full treatment of this later in Athrobeth Finrod Aendreth. 
exactly. Yeah, he's going to he's going to come back to this in a big way. We're not going to worry about this too much, but it's interesting to see these initial thoughts. The most important principle I think that we need to take from this note is the fact that the elves are guessing. Guessing and supposing is all they got, right? And they they don't know. They can only they can only judge based on what they know and they don't know much about the fate of humans. More later when we get to the Athrobath. Um, Christopher Bartlett says, that plays Merry Hell with Turin and the Dagor Dagoroth. Well, <laughs> you'll notice, Christopher, how the Dagor Dagoroth does not get narrated again. Ever. Uh, yep. I don't know. I don't know. Um, oh, Matt, sorry, I missed your comment when we were thinking about uh, the Fea as light. Uh, Matt was also thinking about... Um, Gollum's lamp-like eyes. Uh, I think, Matt, you were kind of joking about that. But I'm not sure you're wrong, actually. In fact, I think it's at least as good an illustration of this exact same principle as the, the wells of light in Galadriel's eyes. Um, remember how, how um, Gollum's eyes change color? I mean, the light. I mean, they emit light. Like, we can't get around the fact that Gollum's eyes Im actually emit light. It is not metaphorical, right? When, uh, when, uh, when Gollum's eyes are described as shining in the darkness, it's not reflected light uh, like, a, you know, like an animal in the headlights. It's not um, a mere metaphor of the brightness of those eyes. Light is physically being emitted from Gollum's eyes. That's explicit. We know this for a fact because Bilbo can see the light from behind his head when he's following up, the, following him up the tunnel. Right. Not to mention the charming biographical detail of uh, the story of I'm forgetting which one of his sons did this, but one of the older sons showing up in Christopher's room with two with two flashlights. Right. Uh, pretending to be Gollum. In the darkness, uh, again, showing that like the luminous eyes shining light was clearly like a part of the concept of Gollum uh, from the beginning. Um, but um, anyway, um, so. Uh, yeah. All right. Anyhow, but 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 yeah, Matt, back to the point. Why do his eyes shine sometimes with a pale and sometimes with a green light? What well, it's. It's about a shift in his will. We see Gollum's will shifting back and forth, right? Um, and uh, and that his, you know, sort of his 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 will, of, you know, that his his fair shining. There's no other explanation for it, right? Um, I absolutely think, although it seems a little bit odd, I absolutely think that Gollum's luminescent eyes are definitely an example, um, possibly the most explicit outward and material example of Thea as light that we get in Tolkien's entire corpus. I'm having a hard time. Um, I'm having a hard time thinking about um, uh, thinking of any more obvious example. Gorfindel's luminescence is pretty clear. Especially in that initial description, right? The, uh, especially to Frodo's eyes, right? As he sees a light that shines through the form and raiment of the rider. Um, but even that, you see, is like colored by the fact that it's Frodo's sight and he's already partially in the spirit world. So it's not necessarily physicalized. So I still think that Gollum is a more, much more explicit version of the same kind of thing. Um, and it could well be, Christopher, an effect of the ring blurring the sort of the boundaries between the physical and the spiritual there. Um, and so, and that, therefore, it could be one of the sort of not frequently cited side effects of uh, ring ownership. Right. We see it in Frodo, too. Right. Uh, him, as Gandalf said, not in the same way as uh, as Gollum. Uh, but again, the, his his being becoming a, a vessel for light. Right. Uh, becoming sort of emptied out in this way. Um, yeah. 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 Matt was thinking of something similar about the sort of his b body being stretched, his roa uh, being stretched. And so therefore the fea. Uh, yeah. I mean, Matt, 
goodness, if we think about, we're not going to do this for very long. But uh, if we think about the ring stuff, right, the butter stretched over too much bread phenomenon in terms of the Hroa and Fea, um, it begins to make some sense in exactly that way, right? Um, but um, yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering to what extent the th the story making and the thinking that he'd already been doing in writing The Lord of the Rings, during the course of the writing of The Lord of the Rings, the more that emerged about the physical and the spiritual and and, 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 and all the Englor Findel and his relation, his, you know, uh, elves of Valinor and whatever existing on both sides at once and all this sort of thing. All this stuff came uh, in The Return of the King, which he wrote now a long time ago, you know, many years before, well, several years anyway, before he was writing this stuff. Um, in other words, this stuff has been on his mind. I'm, I'm wondering how much that stuff, the ring stuff, kind of primed the pump for the sort of philosophical uh, rethinks and applications uh, that he's doing here in this whole book. Uh, and uh, my answer to that would be, I would think probably quite a bit, actually. Probably quite a bit. Um, yeah. Yeah, David says, the relationship between Fea and Light implies some pretty awful things about Shelob's soul. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It makes Ungoliant horrifying. Absolutely. Ungoliant has always been, in some ways one of the most pure embodiments of evil in Tolkien's world. Melkor, of course, is the big bad of Tolkien's world. But Melkor is always, from the beginning, a powerful good guy gone bad, right? A force of good who is misapplying his talents. That is always Melkor's story, has always been Melkor's story. In Ungoliant we see, like, extracted the impulse for badness, in a sense, if you follow me, more purely than in, um, than in Melko. And that's always been true. I could say Melko, because true all the way back to the Book of Lost Tales. Um, that's why, although obviously Melkor is the, is the primary force for evil in Arda, and always has been from the very beginning... Um, whenever, if ever I am trying to sort of identify or describe or explain what evil is, the essence of evil, according to Tolkien, the essence of evil in Tolkien's thought, it's Ungoliant and Shelob that I would go to every time. Ungoliant because Shelob is, you know, an application of Ungoliant, a sort of knockoff of Ungoliant. Um, but anyway, that's, yeah, so definitely, David, definitely. Um, yes. And Josiah is pointing out how Melkor, Glaurung, and Smaug are also known to exert their will through their gaze. Yes. Yes. Again, thinking about the, like the light shining out, right? The way that the, you know, so that even when there aren't like actual flashlights shining around like Gollum has, um, if you meet the gaze of Glaurung or you meet the gaze of Smaug or certainly you meet the gaze of Melkor, you are being hit by their will is still kind of shining out from their eyes, if not in a physical and luminescent way, uh, at least in a, in a, uh, in a, in a spiritual sense. Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Tomas, exactly. Tomas is saying Melkor's career, of course, is parallel to that of Lucifer, whose name means the light carrier, right? Uh, whereas Ungoliant uh, is the light eater. It's a, it's a totally different kind of kind of thing. Exactly. The one who carries light and does bad things with it, sort of, in a sense, right? Compared to the one who eats light and generates unlight and twists it into unlight. Um, yeah, totally, totally different. Um, anyway, okay. All right. Um, but let's keep going. So we're going to talk now 
briefly, I hope briefly, uh, about some of the later versions, uh, of the later revisions that Tolkien was doing to the uh, Finway and Muriel story and this whole section here. Um, my, one of my questions was still, okay, not only, so I already talked about my question for Christopher, which is, why didn't you include this stuff? Like about Muriel getting her new name, Furio? I mean, it's one of those things where, like, in retrospect, I was always a little bit bothered by the fact that Muriel's story doesn't get any payoff. I mean, like, it says in the published Silmarillion that her body remains, in, you know, unparried, you know, still, like, fine, right? You know, it, it, it her body doesn't perish and, and is kept uh, in Lorien. And then we never get anything more, right? We never close the circle. Um, we we never close the circle on uh, uh, on Muriel, right? So again, one question which I already asked, which Christopher didn't answer, is why did he make that choice uh, in the published Silmarillion? But my other question is, what was Tolkien's plan? So he's written all this stuff. Right. And it emerged very naturally in the way that we've often seen happen. Right. He's thinking about this and he thinks best when he's, you know, writing these things and discovering them as he goes. And so the whole debate of the Valar and everything seemed to emerge as a way to continue thinking about these things and answering questions that he had. So remember when he shifted from doing the like kind of uh, very sort of stale and um, uh, confusing kind of Q and a thing, uh, right. To when he, when he shifted to the dialogue of the Valar, things really kind of took off and he really kind of worked things out much more clearly. Um, okay. But the question is, what, what was he going to do with that story? Right. He was, this was all happening in the context of revising the Quintus Silmarillion. In fact, like the entire laws and customs of the Eldar, which then culminates in, this long digression on the marriage of Finway and Muriel and the whole debate of the Valar and everything else and the statute and then the f subsequent narrative. Was this all going in somehow? Was it going to extract it out somehow? What was his plan? So uh, I think we can extract some clues, perhaps. We can perceive some clues here in this passage. So here's a revised passage. Then Manway was moved with pity for Finway, and he considered his plea. This is his original plea to remarry. But because this seemed to him a great matter, and not lightly to be judged, he summoned the Valar in council. Of the long debate that they held, the elves wrote a record, for their chieftains were permitted to be present. This was called the Statute of Finway and Muriel, and was preserved among the chief of their books of law. For in the debate, before the statute was at last established by the doom of Namo Mendos, many matters concerning the Eldar, their fate in Arda, their death and rebirth, and the nature of their marriage were examined and judged. And the Valar were greatly concerned to see that all their labor for the guarding of Valinor was of no avail, to keep out evil, and the shadow of Melkor, if anything, living or unliving, was brought thither out of Middle-earth and left free or unguarded. And they perceived at last how great was the power of Melkor and Arda, in the making of which it was his part. Oh, sorry, in the making of which, as it was his part, was such that all things, save an Amon alone, had an inclination to evil and to perversion from their right forms and courses. Sorry, the syntax of that sentence is confusing. Let me reread the end part, that, that really important bit again. Um, uh, how great was the power of Melkor in Arda, that all things, save an Amon alone, had an inclination to evil and to perversion from their right forms and courses. All things have an inclination to evil and to perversion from right forms and courses. Wherefore, those whose being began in Arda, and who, moreover, were by nature a union of spirit and body, drawing the sustenance of the latter from Arda Mard, must ever be, in some degree, liable to grief, to do or to suffer things unnatural. And though dwelling in Amman might be a guard against this evil, it was not a full cure, unless in long ages. And with this thought a shadow passed over the hearts of the Valar, even in the noontide of the Blessed Realm, presage of the sorrows which the children should bring into the world." Okay. Um, 
two things here. We'll come back to talk about that latter part in a minute. We'll talk about the whole, like, the question of the marring of Arda and, and how that's articulated there. The first thing I want to emphasize, do you see what I think is a textual cue there? So this passage is written, this is the first revision after he's written the whole council and the whole laws and customs of the Eldar, right? So he's done all the digressing. And now he's going back and he's doing a new version. And we see, is he going to include the whole digression in the version? No, he's not. That's obviously inappropriate. Um, it would be a major departure from the form of the Quintus Silmarillion, right, as it was unfolding. So he's not going to do that. But he's not going to forget it either, right? He mentions it, and indeed he mentions it by name. This was called the Statute of Finway and Muriel and was preserved among the chief of their books of law. Um, and notice what he includes in this. The council, right? Um, the debate, which not only concerns the statute, but also many matters concerning the Eldar, their fate and ardor, their death and rebirth, and the nature of their marriage. In, in other words, the entire laws and customs of the Eldar, it seems to me, is included with this. So what was Tolkien's plan? What does this suggest Tolkien's plan probably was? I think Tolkien's plan was to include that as a separate work. I think that he was, I don't know if it, it would have been included as an appendix or something, but this I take, this I take to be a kind of rule. Well, rule, that's a hard word. Uh, it's a strong word. It makes me a little uncomfortable. Um, you will be able to think of many other times when Tolkien has mentioned a work, and especially in the Silmarillion context, has mentioned a work by title um, and then not, of course, included it, right? Um, one thing that we notice in reading through the history of Middle-earth, especially the Lays of Beleriand back in the day, Volume 3, was that a, a large number, it's a smaller number than 100%, but a large percentage of the poems that Tolkien alludes to in the course of the narrative are poems that he actually wrote or at least begun, began, right? Um, there are, and, and therefore, those things that he points to and never did write, I think are very likely to be things that he wanted to write or hoped to write or dreamed of writing. Um, so my theory, and this is now, keep in mind, this is me guessing, um, my guess based on this passage and the other things that we've seen through the history of Middle-earth, I think that the ideal Silmarillion, right, like the the the... Tolkien's, if Tolkien could do it exactly, could present it exactly how he wanted it to be presented, uh, if he could freeze time, could have frozen time and given himself an infinite space in which to do all of the writing that he wanted to do, uh, untrammeled by any outside things and never having to grade another paper in his life, um, and then could have resumed the passage of time and published his work, um, I think what he would have wanted to do is a multi-volume work which would contain each one of these things. We've seen this impulse. Back in 1937, we saw this during The Lost Road, right, volume five. We saw his impulse to a multi-part Silmarillion. And remember what that, the thing, which he was at the time actively preparing for publication, right? It included a whole bunch of different sections. It included the Akalabeth. It included the Embarkanta, the shape of the world. Uh, it, it, no, not the Akalabeth. I'm sorry. I meant the Aino Lindale. The Aino Lindale. It included uh, the, um, uh, the Embarkanta, the, the shape of the world. It included the maps. It included the annals of Beleriand and the Annals of Amman. It included Annals of Valinor, I think they were then. Uh, it included the Quintus Silmarillion, right? Uh, it then, of course, got, then it gets stuff added to it. We already saw his impulse to make the poems. I think it would include, again, in his perfect world and unrestricted by any realism, uh, uh, by the publishing market, it would also include 
the full epic poem versions of the Narn, Ihin Hurin, right? The, the, the story of the children of Hurin, the alliterative uh, uh, Narn. It would include a full version of the Lay of Lathian, right? The full poem of the Lay of Lathian. It would include the full poem of, about the Kinslaying, right? Which he begins, uh, but, you know, he wrote some of that, but he didn't write that much of it. The Hlamas, absolutely, Josiah. The Tale of the Tree of Tongues, right? The Hlamas gets in there as well. Um, and then, of course, we've seen him adding more stuff. Right, the Akalabeth, uh, and uh, and the fall of uh, not just the one Akalabeth, but the, uh, the 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 other stuff, the stuff that we were looking at in uh, Sauron defeated. Right, all the the uh, the really interesting uh, different perspectives on the fall of Numenor uh, stuff that was going to be in there as well, um, uh, and then. Yeah, he also says there's going to be a big Arendel poem, which of course he doesn't get around to writing. Um, Christopher, yes, sure. The the lament of Turin for Beleg, another good example of a poem that gets like cited by name as if it's a thing, but we but he never wrote it, right? Well, uh, yeah, I'm sure he wanted to write it. I bet he had ideas for what that could look like, but he never got around to it, right? So, um, yeah, uh, my suspicion is that's what the and so he was going to have. A new bit, right? He was going to extract all this out to a new bit called the Statute of Finway and Muriel, I guess, right? Um, so he was going to, he was probably going to revise that. This almost makes, doesn't this make it sound like he's going to go back and he's going to redo the laws and customs in the form of the debate that he really liked the whole Valar Council thing and was going to, going to redo the entire thing, like all of this extra material? in the context of this one council, right? As like minutes of the council, uh, assembled by the chieftains of the elves who were present at the time. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that's my suspicion as to what Tolkien wanted the Silmarillion to look like. Uh, and as I've said before, in a world in which one does have to think about the practicalities of the publishing situation, it is not shocking that, uh, um, uh, that <laughs> nobody ever would publish it, right? Yeah, but but I, I that's my sense here. My sense here is that he is, um, he definitely wants to include this stuff, but he's not just going to interrupt the narrative, and he's not going to scrap. He's not going to be like, okay, forget the Quenta, we're doing this instead. He instead, as we can see, that's what's happening here is he's going on with the Quenta, but he doesn't want to lose this. He's gonna. It's just it gets a title. Right. And I think he was going to I think he was going to publish this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Chris Red's very beautiful. Uh, Chris Bartlett is now imagining who he says now that Christopher has joined him. You know, he's now imagining the part of heaven in which J.R.R. Tolkien is, in fact, finishing all of this poetry and writing all of these works. Christopher is putting all of his papers in order uh, while Edith dances for joy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yep, that would have been amazing. Um, you know, Stephen, I wonder, Stephen Cover is uh, is uh, saying, um, would Tolkien have enjoyed that feature of modern technology, a greater ability to self-publish? You know, I could easily imagine it, Stephen. I mean, could I imagine Tolkien, had Tolkien lived 75 years later? Right. Had he been born 75 years later, uh, maybe 80, 90 years later, um, I absolutely could see him keeping uh, like running a, a really nerdy blog uh, of like his, uh, uh, you know, his his elvish etymologies and uh, language stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I could totally see his linguistic papers being kept as a blog. Would not be shocking. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So, but that that's my sense. It's only a guess, but it's my sense. And by the way, it also seems to me to offer, if we then uh, further, um, if we then further speculate about what, if I'm right about what Tolkien's hopes and dreams were for this material, it might help us to make a guess then as to why Christopher didn't include any of this stuff. Cut this passage right out of the Silmarillion. Um, 
or rather chose not to include this passage in the Silmarillion, to be more fair, um, because it's not getting published, right? Uh, the statute of Finway and Muriel isn't getting published, and so he just kind of downplays the whole... He doesn't hide the fact that it's a big issue, right? And that there was a debate and that there was uncertainty that followed and the whole, like, it probably would have been a better idea for him not to remarry, but then again, there wouldn't be any of his kids and those were cool. So, you know, kind of, you know, that, that gets left into the published Silmarillion, you'll remember. Um, but none of the details of the council, none of this other stuff gets put in there. And it kind of sounds like Christopher, remember, he's already told us that one of the chief principles that he was applying when he edited the Silmarillion, um, was consistency, right? Trying to hold it together and make it consistent. So since he wasn't going to publish, the statute, right? He wasn't going to publish this material. Um, uh, then he uh, he doesn't allude to it because he doesn't want to leave that loose end. That would make sense to me. Why wouldn't he publish it, you ask, as an appendix? As I did ask, right, as we were reading it. Again, I think that this passage helps us perhaps to understand that too. Again, only guessing here. But the evidence of this passage implies to me that Tolkien was planning to recast the laws and customs of the Eldar. The thing that I found frustrating when we were going through the laws and customs of the Eldar was I, I kept saying, remember, like, as is, this could have been published as, a, as, a, as an appendix. Why wasn't it? Right? We get all this stuff. Why wasn't it included? It could have been an appendix. Um, answer, because that's not what Tolkien wanted. Tolkien wanted it to be revised in this way, to be part of the council. But Christopher's not going to do that, right? That's inconsistent with Christopher's editorial approach. He's not going to be like, okay, so let me like put a whole bunch of words in the mouths of various Valar, you know, and recast this whole thing. He's not going to do that. He knows that that's what his father wanted. So in the end, he just left it out. That's a guess, but we'll see. Anyway, okay. To then come back to the big deal there in the last part about Artemard. Well, briefly, because we'll come back to this on a, on a, on a f upcoming slide soon. Um, but his the clarity of his restatement here is important. This is these are issues that we've addressed and seen before. But um, I, but um, he's very clear and explicit here. Um, the inclination to evil and to perversion from their right forms and courses that all things in Arda experience. Save in Amon alone, except not even there, right? Even there, there is this inclination. There is apparently a dampening field in Arda, in, in Amon, right? So in Valinor, this inclination to perversion and evil is dampened, but it's not completely prevented. It can be, I guess, cured, or but or maybe they're wrong about that, because, of course, this is one of the things that we see. Um, uh, this is one of the things that we see as we um, as we move forward, is that uh, the Valar are kind of wrong about this. Josiah, that's a really uh, neat insight. Josiah says Valinor, uh, in this sense, is what the Elven Rings wanted to be, to purify bits, right? To create a land without stain. Everything is stained in Arda, right? But what if you could create a land that has no stain upon it, right? Um... I think the Valar are mistaken when they assume that there's no stain, that like um, Valinor is unstainable, right? That proves to be untrue. I think that Aragorn is speaking a little over enthusiastically when he describes Lorien as a land without stain. Um, but nevertheless, I think the similarity is certainly uh, a, a really interesting one there, Josiah. OK, let's keep going. So now again, this is uh, this is the I th if I'm recalling correctly, this is the latest version uh, of the narrative that he wrote. 
Then Manway called Finway to him and said, Thou hast heard the doom that has been declared. If Muriel thy wife will not return, your marriage is ended, and thou hast leave to take another wife. But this is permission, not counsel. For the severance cometh from the marring of Arda, and those who accept this permission accept the marring. Whereas the bereaved who remain steadfast belong in spirit and will to Arda unmarred. This is a grave matter upon which the fate of many may depend. Be not in haste. The thing that I love about these later versions, the things, it's, it's not like he's totally changing the story here. But what's really interesting to me is seeing as we saw him thinking through the ramifications of all these issues before. Now in these revised versions, we're seeing him bring all of that thought really efficiently into the original narrative. And it's fascinating to see that stuff, right? Notice how all of that, like, preaching stuff about the high path and the path of justice and how healing comes with hope and all that stuff has been embodied in a sentence. Those who accept this permission accept the marring whereas the bereaved who remain steadfast belong in spirit and will to Arda unmarred. This is a grave matter upon which the fate of many may depend. Be not in haste. Finway answered, I am in no haste, my lord, and my heart has no desire, save the hope that when this doom is made clear to Muriel, she may yet relent and set a term to my bereavement. Vire, with whom Muriel dwelt, made known to her the doom, and spoke also of the sorrow of Finway. But Muriel answered, I came hither to escape from the body, and I do not desire ever to return to it. My life has gone out into Feanor my son. The gift I have given to him whom I, that gift I have given to him whom I loved, I can give no more. Beyond Arda this may be healed, but not within it. This is very similar, of course, to Vire's statement before, and notice that there is still the same ambiguity we earlier observed. That gift I have given to him whom I loved. Uh, who? Husband or son? Right? She's speaking in the singular. I think in the context it's got to be Finway, right? Because we're talking about Finway's love for her. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, Stephen, exactly. Uh, Stephen points out that Manway has gone from a sermon to a proverb. Yes, we see we see the thing being the, 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 the idea being digested. Right. And coming out in this more mature form. Um, and Matt, I agree. This seems to be consistent with Tolkien's tendency to use fewer words with each revision. Yeah, I have to admit, again, I. I, I could wish that. Christopher had used that paragraph 16 in the published Silmarillion. He didn't. He used the full narrative from before, uh, not any of these later narratives, which don't think I'd have gone that way, but, you know, look. Uh, it's indecent to complain. Uh, skipping a little bit ahead then, reading about Muriel's doom. Then Vire said to Mandos, the spirit of Muriel hath dwelt with me, and I know it. It is small, but it is strong and obdurate. One of those who, having said, this will I do, make their words a law irrevocable unto themselves. Unless constrained, she will not return to life or to Finway, though she should wait until the aging of this world. Vire's words from the council now being put into the narrative itself. Right, We, we see some recycling happening here. But Mandos said, It is not lawful for the Valar to constrain the dead to return. And he summoned the spirit of Muriel to appear before him. Thy will must rule in this matter, spirit of Muriel, once wife of Finway, he said. In Mandos thou shalt abide, but take heed. Thou art of the Quendi, and even if thou refuse the body, thou must remain in Arda and within the time of its history. The Eldar are not as the Valar. Their spirits are less strong to stand than thou deemest. Do not wonder, then, if thy will should change in time, and this doom which thou takest upon thyself become grievous to thee, yea, and to many others. But the spirit of Muriel remained silent. Mandos therefore accepted her choice, and she went then to the halls of waiting, appointed to the Eldar, and was left in peace. Nonetheless, Mandos declared that a space of twelve years should pass between the declaration of the will of the dead and the pronouncement of the doom of disunion. 
Again, all this stuff not included in the final Silmarillion, the early version of the narrative reverted to by Christopher instead. Um, but I really prefer, um, I really prefer this version. I got to tell you, I really do. Um, I am really interested in Mandos's words here, his take heed, right? Um, the way that he also, and once again, just like, we, you know, Stephen, you were talking about Manway going from a sermon to, to a proverb. Again, the way that Mandos is sort of processing and uh, releasing in really pithy and potent form the, uh, uh, the ideas of the Valar in the council, I think is really powerful. Um, yeah. Yeah, and David, I don't know why the change from 10 to 12 years. Um, I don't know. I think to give, like, I don't know, extra time? I, I, why two years extra should do it? I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Christopher, after this in his commentary, uh, goes back and talks about he gives passages looking at death and rebirth among the Eldar from the Book of Lost Tales onward. That's a very useful summary. Um, and uh, here are the conclusions that he comes to at the end. Um, the testimony of all these passages and others not cited early and late is that elvish death or seeming death in the words of the Aino Lindale, was always a possible fate deriving from their nature as incarnate beings. But there is a constant threat of ambiguity imposed by the words that must be used. The elves cannot die in the sense that men die, since men, by the gift of Iluvatar, depart from the world never to return, whereas the elves cannot depart from it so long as it lasts. In the legend of Baron and Luthien, Mandos offered her a choice, and the doom that she chose was that the destiny decreed by her nature should be changed. So it was that alone of the Eldalier she has died indeed and left the world long ago. But the elves can nonetheless suffer the severance of spirit from body, which is death. Thus it may be said that the essential distinction between the possible death of elves and the inevitable death of men is a difference of destiny after death. See Volume 5 page 304, and also custom, Laws and Customs, page 218. From their beginnings, the chief difference between elves and men lay in the fate and nature of their spirits. The Fear of the elves were destined to dwell in Arda for all the life of Arda, and the death of the flesh did not abrogate that destiny. One of the things that was really uh, that was really fun um, with um, um, in reading this passage, getting to this passage again at the end of our long discussions of this, uh, of laws and customs and then of the, of the debate and all this, you know, the council and all this stuff. Um, when we finally got to Christopher's commentary here uh, towards the end, I don't know if how many of you had this same experience, but when I, when I was reading this passage, I was like, well, yeah, Christopher, you've already made this really, really clear. And then I was like, no, wait, he's not, explain this stuff explicitly. We've talked about this for hours and hours and hours, right? So we've already drawn these conclusions pretty clearly and indeed like have noticed a great, you know, his his conclusions seem kind of cursory, which of course is perfectly appropriate in the context of what he's doing, right? If we were to write out the kind of commentary that we've been doing on these uh, passages as we've gone on, it would be like this whole companion volume, right? So, um, uh, no surprise at all that Christopher, in fact, choose the more, chooses the more tactful route and draws attention to this important principle, uh, but uh, doesn't uh, dwell on things to quite the extent that we have. And yes, uh, several of you are pointing out that the shift from 10 to 12, of course, does make sense uh, in that in the the elvish tendency to count in 12s. And so in shifting it from 10 to 12, he's bringing it in line uh, with that uh, sort of elvish concept. Um, mentioned in the appendices of the Lord of the Rings. Um, so, yeah, that, that seems to be a, a revision, therefore. Not an addition, not just Mando saying, I, I'm going to tack two more years onto it, but saying, basically Tolkien realizing, yeah, I said 10 years before, but it shouldn't be 10, it should be 12. That's how elves would think of it. I, I, I agree, that seems very, very likely. Um, so, uh, yeah, anyway. But this was a this was this section was was definitely a good summary. 
back to Muriel though. Uh, and Muriel, Muriel, Furiel, and the gift of, uh, the gift of Iluvatar to men. Um, so we begin with a passage describing a, a passage from a draft letter that Tolkien wrote to a reader in the Elvish legends. There is a record of a strange case of an elf, Muriel, mother of Feanor, that tried to die, which had disastrous results, leading to the fall of the High Elves. The Elves were not subject to disease, but they could be slain. That is, their bodies could be destroyed or mutilated so as to be unfit to sustain life. But this did not lead naturally to death. They were rehabilitated and reborn and eventually recovered memory of all their past. They remained identical. But Muriel wished to abandon being and refused rebirth. But Muriel wished to abandon being. This is Christopher's commentary now. This is a dark saying. There is nothing in any of the accounts to suggest that she desired annihilation, the ending of her existence in any form. In Laws and Customs, my father wrote that some Fayar in grief or weariness gave up hope and turning away from life relinquished their bodies, even though these might have been healed or indeed or were indeed unhurt. Few of these desired to be reborn, not at least until they had been long in waiting, some never returned. This surely accords with what is told of the death of Muriel. Yes, Christopher, I agree. That's true. That does accord with the death of Muriel. But is it possible that Muriel's situation was more extreme? Than those other ones that he described there? Yes, it's like those. Um, Calebrian, of course, is another example, right? A similar example, anyway. She doesn't exactly die. She goes into the West. But still, it's the same kind of impulse, right? Um, if the fairy weren't set up, you know, had had uh, Calebrian been experiencing what she experienced back, way back, uh, you know, in the First Age, during the Nol the, uh, uh, the Noldoran exile, presumably she'd have left her body behind, right, and gone off instead of sailing off. But anyway, anyway, whatever. Point is, um, does that fit Muriel? Yes, it does, Christopher. But does that mean that that fully explains Muriel? No. Um, and I think we already saw some hints that there was more to it, right? The way in which her new name, Furiel, links Muriel's death with mortal death, right? Linguistically links it, identifies it almost with mortal death. Um, that seems to me important. And a good reason to think that Muriel's condition, though I agree, very similar to these other, you know, it's this kind of thing is not unknown, but everybody doesn't get called Furiel either, right? Um, so I am less, I, f I'm always really hesitant to say things like this because if ever Christopher says, this is something that's very difficult to understand and I don't get it. And I'm reading what he's saying and I'm like, actually, it seems pretty clear to me. I always feel like I'm probably wrong. <laughs> like I must be making a mistake or I must be not seeing things that Christopher is. Uh, and that's very likely true here. But again, but this does not seem to me so dark a saying. Um, Muriel's words saying that there is no healing in Arda. That's a big deal. Notice that this passage that he quotes from Laws and Customs even though some never return, some of these others never return to their bodies, yet nevertheless, um, they are still long in waiting. Like the, We don't hear that even those who don't choose to return to their bodies despair that healing can be found within Arda. Muriel's positive statement that she disbelieves that there is healing possible for her within the bounds of Arda does to me suggest a desire to depart from Arda. A kind of foreshadowing? For, not for knowledge, but uh, this kind of precursor of the gift of Iluvatar to men. Just as we were saying before, um, uh, George, I think it was you who was saying that uh, this it kind of gives us a, 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 an idea, a kind of taste of why the gift of Iluvatar might be a desirable thing and seen by elves even to be a desirable thing. Um, uh, yeah, we do. And, and Muriel shows it to us. So is this... 
Is this a horrible thing by Muriel? No, but it's a despairing thing, right? She despairs of healing within Arda and seeks release from that. Um, uh, so, yeah, no, I don't think Muriel is in the same position as the rest of those elves described in Laws and Customs there. Going on to the next paragraph. It seems at any rate that when my father said here that Muriel tried to die, he meant that she sought a true death. Like a human death, yeah. Not a seeming death, but a departure forever out of Arda. I agree, Christopher. It seems like that to me, too. Yet this could not be, insists Christopher. For death in this sense was contrary to the given nature of elves, appointed by Iluvatar. Yeah, Christopher, I know it is. That's the point. That's just what the Valar were talking about, right? That it was unnatural. Olmo says it's a failure in hope, right? Anyway, sorry. Uh, and indeed, in Of Finway and Muriel, paragraph 20, Mando spoke to the Fea of Muriel, saying, In Mandos thou shalt abide, but take heed. Thou art of the Quendi, and even if thou refuse the body, thou must remain in Arda and within the time of its history. Yeah, he's telling her no. That doesn't mean she doesn't want it, right? All we're told, all Tolkien said in that draft letter was that she wished to abandon being. Not that she did, right? Not that it was an option. It wasn't an option. And Mandos explains. Yes, Mandos explains. No, you can't do it, Muriel. Not going to happen. Give up. Give up on your despair, <laughs> right? Uh, um, but yeah, like that she desires. Uh, so I, Christopher seems to insist, like he says it can't be. It can't be that she possibly desired that because... Death in that sense is contrary to... Yeah, I know! That's what everybody was talking about. It just, I, I, this doesn't seem to me that hard. Um, and I think that, actually, the thing that Christopher is resisting so hard here seems to me like a really important element uh, in Muriel's story, right? And, and uh, pointed to explicitly within the text, right? When they talk about the fault that she has and the um, and her despair and her lack of hope, all of those things. And Josiah, I totally agree that this makes the choice of Luthien much more significant. The choice given to Luthien much more significant. Absolutely. Um, um, Josiah, for that reason, oh man, I love the idea of Muriel's despair here, especially the fact that it gets healed, right? And she comes back and, 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 uh, and, and, and achieves healing from that despair. The fact that we close that loop as well and she becomes furial, that's so cool. So we see that this impulse, this elvish impulse, that there is an elf who has the impulse to want to just leave Arda, who despairs of Arda entirely um, and wants to leave it and is told no. You can't leave it. So that later on, when Luthien comes back, she said she's given the option. and she. But her choice is a totally different one from Muriel's choice, right? So the full Muriel story, the story of Muriel's despair and of Muriel's, uh, of Muriel's healing, right? If you compare that full, so if you take Muriel and then you take Luthien and you compare, oh my goodness, that makes a, beautiful, amazing story. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so anyway, I, uh, uh, and again, did this influence Christopher's de decision to downplay all of this stuff? in the published Silmarillion? Maybe it did. Now, David Attlee is suggesting that Christopher isn't necessarily saying, when he says this could not be, Christopher doesn't mean my father could not have meant that she wanted that. It's impossible. Her desiring that is impossible. It might seem that that's what dad meant, but it isn't, couldn't be what he meant. David instead suggests that what Christopher, when Christopher says, yet this could not be, he means, um, Muriel, it was impossible for Muriel to attain her desire. That's possible, David. We could read it that way. But again, he says this is a dark saying, which means he doesn't understand it. Like, I don't understand what my dad meant when he said Muriel wished to abandon being. And then in that, because in that first paragraph, Christopher is basically saying, there's no abandoning being here. She's she's just like all those other elves in laws and mentioned in laws and customs like this. 
she was the first one to do it, but it became a thing, right? And and it's a, and they weren't abandoning being. It becomes an, it's part of the norm, and we know this is not part of the norm for elves, right? And so therefore, it can't be. It's that's why it sounds to me like he's saying, "I can't believe that Dad actually meant Muriel wished to abandon being." Um, but I think he did mean that. But I mean, maybe I was made, so. Maybe I'm wrong, David. I mean, yours is a. Uh, definitely a more charitable reading of Christopher there than mine. Um, so that by itself could be a good reason to go with that. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, Steve and I agree. Um, and somebody else was talking about that too. Who was talking about this before? Um, no, oh, you, right. Okay, excellent. Um, Stephen is pointing out that like the desire for things which are contrary to what is appointed by Iluvatar from the beginning is also, of course, like the whole centerpiece of the Numenor story. Like men are wishing for things that are not like a uh, part of Iluvatar's plan all the time. Right. And nobody thinks that's weird. Um, why should we find it weird if one elf does the same thing right in the other, in the opposite direction. Um, but um, anyway, okay. All right. Ooh, Michelle, I am super tempted, but I'm going to resist the temptation to digress and talk about Luthien's choice in the context of this. That is enormously tempting, but I'm not going to do it because we've almost achieved my desire and we're already pretty much out of time anyway. Um, hang on a second. I'm going to look ahead. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, we're so close. We've got three passages left. We're not going to do three passages, though. Um, all right. Let's stop here. We'll stop here. Um, after Muriel's despair. That's, that's, that's a good ending spot anyway. Uh, we were so close. We've got three passages left on the whole thing, and then we're going to move forward. So the goal next time. I hope that next week I want to finish the later Quentin material. All the way. All the way to the end. All the way up to, but not including the Athrobeth for next week. That is my plan. We'll see if we can get that far, but I think that we will get pretty close to it, even if we don't get all the way. So my goal will be to do all the pre athrobeth material next week and then to start the Athrobeth in the week following. Okay? All right. That's the point. Now that I have to dole out your like reading assignment on a week-to-week -week basis because uh, the original reading assignment's wholly irrelevant at this point. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the uh, conversation. Don't forget... One more week. Sign up for MythMoot. It's going to be awesome. I look forward to uh, hanging out with you guys who are already attending. Uh, and I will see you guys next week. Bye now. The MythGuard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.